This video is a production of the Methodotra Association, a European educational association centered in Milan, dedicated to the development of human potential. Hello, my name is Henry Whitfield. I'm a student of TIR, or Traumatic Incident Reduction, which is part of a greater subject called Applied Metapsychology, originated by Dr. Frank Gabodi. Now I'd like to introduce Marion Falkman, a certified advanced TIR and, and metapsychology facilitator. She is also a trainer, a technical director, and author of some of the TIR training materials. We're happy to bring you this video, which is an interview with Dr. Garbodi, produced by our good friend and colleague, Giovanni Crivellaro in Italy. The video will show you what traumatic incident reduction is and how it works to relieve the effects of traumatic stress. I expect after you see it, you may want to find out more. At the end, there will be a list of books you can obtain from your local practitioner, your nearest practitioner, or from Amazon.com. One of the best ways of finding out about TIR, finding out more about it, is our website, www.tir.org. There are quite a number of interesting articles on the website, and also a list of certified practitioners throughout the world as well as those who are certified as trainers. In addition to the list of scheduled TIR trainings that you'll find on the website, a number of us who are trainers are willing to travel. So if you would like to have TIR training in your area, please contact us. Thank you. This interview consists of an interview with Frank A. Gerbodi, MD, the founder of Applied Metapsychology International, made at his home in Sonoma, California. Dr. Gerbodi was born and raised in San Francisco. He received his BA in philosophy in 1962 at Stanford University, studied philosophy at Cambridge University in England, then did his medical and psychiatric training at Stanford and Yale Medical Schools, completing his training in 1972. His life goal has been to discover and participate in creating practical methods for developing human potential and improving the quality of life. In 1987, Dr. Gerbodi founded the Institute for Research in Metapsychology in Palo Alto, California, now called Applied Metapsychology International, AMI. Currently, Dr. Gerbodi is involved in producing and updating material used in training facilitators in the application of metapsychology-based techniques. In 1988, Dr. Gerbodi wrote a book, Beyond Psychology, An Introduction to Metapsychology, published by IRM Press in Palo Alto, California. He has subsequently written many articles and training manuals. Let's begin this interview with a basic question. What is trauma? What makes an experience traumatic? A trauma is not a particular kind of experience. A trauma consists of a relationship between an experience and the person having the experience. Whether an experience is traumatic or not depends on the person. For instance, most people would consider combat experiences to be traumatic. But for some people, a combat experience is very pleasurable and exciting. If the experience is too intense or in some other way hard for the person to confront, a person will resist the experience, will attempt to not experience it fully, and therefore the experience will be suppressed or repressed to one degree or another. It is this effort to repress and the unconsciousness associated with it that makes an experience into a trauma. Is trauma only physical or also psychological? A trauma is both physical and psychological. And in fact, there can be different kinds of trauma. There can be traumas that come from a physical source, uh -huh. such as physical pain and uh, accidents, operations, and so forth. But really, the essence of a trauma is the psychological part, uh, because the essence of a trauma is the inability or unwillingness to experience something that is happening, whether it be 
a physical thing that's happening or whether it be some kind of situation that's happening, such as the loss of a loved one, such as a divorce, such as a extreme embarrassment or humiliation. Is there a fundamental difference between trauma from domestic violence as opposed to trauma from other events such as war, earthquakes or accidents? Different therapists believe that different kinds of trauma need to be treated in different ways. So they tend to group people together that have similar traumas. Mm -hmm. For instance, accident victims may be one group treated one way, domestic violence victims may be treated a different way, mm -hmm. combat veterans treated with other combat veterans. But in truth, a trauma is simply an incident that one has not fully confronted because mm -hmm. it's too painful. And it doesn't really matter what kind of trauma it is. Any type of trauma will respond well to an approach that encourages more awareness of the trauma so a person can become fully aware of what happened, at which point the trauma is no longer a trauma. TIR is one such approach. Do traumas differ fundamentally from culture to culture, or do the basic elements of trauma remain the same cross-culturally? I would say that the fundamentals are the same. Different cultures can experience different things as traumatic. For instance, perhaps a Japanese would experience a humiliation as particularly more traumatic than, for instance, somebody from Milan. Again, a trauma is a relationship between a person and an experience. A more important question is, what can you do about trauma in different cultures? Is there any approach that will work cross-culturally? And I believe what's needed there is an approach that's very simple, that doesn't have to change from culture to culture and does not rely on any particular culture for its effectiveness. And I believe TIR is that kind of approach. Is there a difference between the effect of a single isolated trauma and that of a prolonged or repeated trauma? There's a big difference between the consequences of having one trauma and a series of traumas in that if you have a series of traumas, they're more easily triggered and uh -huh. they tend to be more severe. In terms of the resolution of the trauma, it's not necessarily more difficult because the method is the same, which is the method of TIR. In TIR, you can trace back one trauma along lines of similarities to earlier and similar traumas until you find the first one, and then you can achieve a resolution. This can be done in one session or in a few sessions. Does a trauma affect a person for his whole life or only immediately after the experience? The effect of a traumatic incident depends on what a person does with the incident afterwards. If a person thinks about the incident, allows themselves to be aware of it, works through the feelings that the incident generates and allows themselves to be aware of those feelings, they can spontaneously resolve the incident over a period of time. And in about half the cases, this is what happens without any additional treatment being necessary. But in the other half of the cases, a person doesn't go through that process. TIR is a technique for doing what happens naturally, but doing it more efficiently and in a shorter space of time. So instead of it taking weeks or months to resolve an incident, person can resolve it in one session or a few sessions. Is it possible to recover the knowledge of the past that is lost when trauma occurs? How? It is possible. In fact, it's necessary to recover the data mm -hmm. from a trauma because the essence of trauma is the loss of data or the suppression of data. And in order to resolve the trauma, you have to recover the data. The person has to become aware yeah. of what happened during the trauma. In other words, he has to become aware of what was repressed at the time. The method of TIR consists of very systematically taking a person to the beginning of the incident, having them go through to the end, being aware of whatever they can be aware of, and then going through the incident repeatedly in that fashion until all of the awareness has been recovered. Why do we need to become aware in order to resolve a trauma? 
There's different explanations for this, but the one I propose to give you at the moment is the explanation that comes from the work of Pavlov. Pavlov did a famous experiment in which he gave a dog a piece of meat and then he measured the salivation of the dog. He then added an unconditioned stimulus, a bell, to the meat. He rang the bell, gave the dog a piece of meat, and of course the dog salivated because of the meat. Then he found that if you simply rang the bell without giving the dog meat, the dog would salivate from simply having the conditioned stimulus alone. In fact, if you were to ring the bell and at the same time give another conditioned stimulus, namely shining a bright light, the dog would salivate because of the bell and then the dog would come to associate the both stimuluses with the meat. And in this case then if you were to shine the light, the dog would salivate. You could then pair another stimulus with the light. For instance, if you shown the light and you pulled the dog's tail gently, of course the dog would salivate. And then if you simply pulled the dog's tail without doing anything else, the dog would salivate. Apparently what's happening here is that when you pull the dog's tail, it reminds him of the bright light. And when he's reminded of the bright light, it reminds him of the bell. And the bell reminds him of the meat. So he salivates. And this is what Pavlov called a chain of associations. In this case, there are four different elements in the chain. There's the, the meat, the bell, the light, and pulling the tail. In a dog, that's about as far as you could go. If you tried to add another association to this, such as putting the dog in a hot space or something like that, the dog would not continue to salivate at that distance from the original stimulus. So that's as far as you can go with a dog. But with a human, we have the amazing ability to associate indefinitely. And therefore, we can make long, long chains of these different associations. Now, suppose instead of giving the dog a piece of meat, you gave them an electric shock. The dog's response would be trembling. and you could then pair the electric shop with the bell, in which case the dog would tremble. If you then just rang the bell, the dog would tremble, and so on with the same response all the way along. This is the basic situation when you have a sequence of traumatic incidents. So what do you need to do to resolve a sequence like this? Well, you have to extinguish the response. And the way you do that is you go back to the original stimulus, the original conditioned stimulus, and you give the original conditioned stimulus without the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, you ring the bell without shocking the dog, and eventually the dog will stop trembling when he hears the bell. 
And once you've done that, what do you think will occur if you shine a light or pull the dog's tail? And as it turns out, getting back to the original condition stimulus, extinguishing the response will cause the rest of these responses to go away. In running a traumatic incident, all we're really doing is going back to the original incident and having the person repeatedly contact the condition stimuli that are in that incident. And when the person does that, the trauma disappears. And if you get to the earliest incident, then the later incidents no longer have any power. That's one explanation for how TIR works. Now, let us take a look at what can happen with a Vietnam veteran who was traumatized in a combat incident in which he saw a buddy being killed, and how he can form a sequence, a chain of associations that can prove troublesome to him later. Beside the traumatic content itself, the first incident on the sequence also contains other content that, by itself, is not traumatic, such as the noise of a helicopter, a line of trees, the taste of chewing gum, a loud noise, etc. The soldier reacts to the first trauma with a feeling of blinding rage. Some years later, this person is walking in the park while chewing gum. He sees a line of trees and he hears the noise of a helicopter. This reminds him consciously or unconsciously of the original trauma, and he suddenly experiences the same feeling of blinding rage. In this second trauma, there are other elements like the smell of a barbecue or the dog barking. The person may target the dog as the object of the rage that he feels. In the third episode, He's chewing gum while barbecuing in the garden with his wife. There is a lot of street noise, and nearby a dog is barking. Again, he feels rage, and this time, perhaps, he will take his anger out on his wife. You forgot the salt for the third time. Next, we find him at a bar with his wife having a beer. The noise of the traffic outside is enough to trigger the feeling of blinding rage. This incident contains other stimuli, such as the taste of beer, a sensation of intoxication, and the smell of cigarette smoke. Each new stimulation, or re-stimulation, creates a secondary trauma, which is added to the sequence of traumatic incidents, and makes the entire sequence more easily re-stimulated. When something happens in life, that reminds the person of any of the components of any of the incidents on the sequence, that person may experience another re-stimulation, again feel the feeling of blinding rage, and add yet another incident to the sequence. To examine and resolve a sequence of several similar linked traumas is not necessarily more difficult than to resolve an individual trauma. In order to resolve the sequence of traumas, we need to find and resolve the first trauma that lies at the root of the sequence. A variety of TIR called thematic TIR does this quite effectively and in a short amount of time. During the time of a trauma, there's usually very little time and a lot of stress and activity that needs to be done. So uh -huh. a person usually cannot allow themselves to be fully aware at that time. In a viewing session, however, the facilitator creates a very safe space and plenty of time so that the person has the leisure to look at the incident repeatedly as slowly as they want to so that they can see the whole incident. And that's what makes it possible to recover the data. How does a person's experience of time change during and after a trauma? Paradoxically, the effort to repress or suppress the data that's in a trauma causes the trauma to stay very close to consciousness. So it seems to a person that the trauma that actually happened in the past is still going on. It's a paradox. It's like not thinking about a pink elephant. 
you have to keep thinking about the pink elephant in order not to think about it. And it keeps that pink elephant right there with you the mm -hmm. whole time. So in the case of a trauma, it's something more serious, obviously. But the effort to stop a trauma keeps it there. And this leads to a confusion between present and past that makes it seem as though a trauma is going on forever in the eternal now. What is the difference between a patient and a client? We don't call the client a patient yeah. because the client is not passive. We expect the client to be active. In fact, uh -huh. the client is the one that does all the important work. What we're trying to get away from is the medical model in which a doctor does something to a patient. The patient receives the treatment and is cured. So. We prefer to use the term viewer because that's the main action that the client does. We're going to now talk about the person-centered viewpoint. That is, how does the world look from the point of view of the person? Not from the point of view of somebody looking at the person from the outside, but from the point of view of the person herself. From the person's viewpoint, we have the person here. And surrounding the person is the person's environment, everything that is part of the person's world. What is in the person's environment? Well, we have physical objects. We have trees, houses, we have other people. And in addition to all that, we have other things that are part of the person's world, such as ideas. Uh, we also have feelings, and we have mental images, images of the past or images in which the person is thinking about the future. Now one of the crucial things to understand is that none of these elements of the person's environment is inside the person. Instead, they are all outside the person. Why is this important? It's important because in order to be aware of something, you have to have some distance from that thing. If my eyeballs are going to be glued to this drawing, I'm not going to see it. I have to be at least some distance from it. And that's true of anything in the person's environment. So in doing person-centered work, we don't ask the person to look inside themselves because a person cannot look inside himself because he is himself. He has to step back from things and look outward at them, seeing them as part of the environment. Uh, he doesn't look inside to find a feeling. He looks out at the feeling from where he is. One corollary of this viewpoint is that a person is not the mental garbage and neuroses and psychoses and stuff that is causing them trouble. This also speaks to Carl Rogers' point that people are basically good. This explains why, because all the things that are wrong are not wrong with the person, but wrong with the person's mental environment. So when we are talking to a client, we don't tell the client, look, we're trying to change you. We say, we're not trying to change you. We're trying to give you tools that you can use to clean up your mental and physical environment. And the main tool is that of simple awareness or what we call viewing. We find this an extremely empowering viewpoint to take and also an extremely practical one. And this is the viewpoint we take in doing viewing and TIR. What is the relationship between trauma and personal growth? A trauma, by definition, is an incident in which a person has not become fully aware <laughs> of something. If he were fully aware, it would not be a trauma. So there is something that remains to be learned in order to resolve a trauma. In the course of doing TIR and other techniques, the person learns what they need to learn to resolve the trauma. And in the course of learning that, 
they grow as a person. Thank you.